I once had a professor who told me, uh, if you have what you think is somewhat of a silly question and you're somewhat embarrassed to ask it, that's very unfortunate because then you are being silly. <laughs> you should really ask what's ever on your mind uh, because that's the way, that's really the way we learn. So is there anybody here who doesn't know what this picture is? Everybody knows. What is it? That's right, the Brooklyn Bridge. And so having given this little speech for each session of this course for 17 years, I'm beginning to think people have had enough of it. But it's very important because we are like those two men on the catwalk. And if you visualize that Brooklyn over there is all the advances in modern molecular, cellular, physical, mathematical, analytical biology. And New York over on this side is where there are patients and physicians trying to figure out what to do with them. And so the whole point of it is to link up, to communicate, uh, not to turn PhDs into MDs or anything like that, but to excite uh, so-called basic scientists with what the challenges are. And as you have seen throughout all of this, of course, everything has enormous challenges, and many of the answers uh, lie in the very reductionist kind of technology and ideas. Uh, nobody knows the answers to these problems, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, younger creative minds, not necessarily all younger, but creative, free thinking will come up to uh, ideas. So uh, let me see if I can navigate this. Ah, so what is the major cause of death in the Western world? Huh? What, do, what do you think, young lady? What's the major cause? Huh? High cholesterol. Okay. So in the course, and you know, we talk about oh, HIV, malaria, and so forth, and we talk about that being the major killer, and it is the major killer. But that's global. We're talking about the Western world, Western Europe, the United States, Canada, and so forth, and so on. And no, it's not hypercholesterolemia. Uh, it's arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is not the same thing, and by far. So people are living longer, and there have been tremendous advances in uh, ameliorating the death rate from uh, uh, particularly myocardial infarction as a major cause of death, yet it remains. And it remains, I think, because... There are more people, and because the processes that give rise to this haven't changed, and the population gets bigger. So it's still the major cause of death, even though these great advances have been made. So the advances have been made because of the identification of risk factors, things like obesity, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, a sedentary lifestyle, smoking, and probably a few other things. And all of those have been subjects of active therapy, as well as pharmacological therapy. Uh, probably, a, I don't know how many, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, almost half the men in the United States over the age of 50 are taking a statin an example of such a widespread use. And it's made, these things have made a tremendous effect, control of hypertension. And yet despite control of these known risk factors, it still is the major cause of death in the Western world. Why, what are we missing? That's the challenge. So in recent years, there's been a great deal of interest in I would say enthusiasm and research along the ideas that the or a missing factor is inflammation. Now, 
If so, what's the evidence for that? It's widely spoken of. Um, people kind of accept it in general. Physicians tend to accept it. But what's the evidence for it? And if so, what are the mechanisms whereby inflammation participates significantly in arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease? And if that's true, what are the therapeutic and diagnostic implications? So this is a very complex subject. And we're very pleased to have two experts here uh, who devote their uh, one clinical as well as research activities toward the study of mechanisms of arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and in particular, this challenging question of the missing factor or factors. So our first speaker is Alan Ramali, who received his MD and PhD in biochemistry from the University of Pittsburgh, trained in clinical pathology, came here as a medical staff fellow in 1990, and got interested in lipoprotein metabolism in the molecular disease branch of the Heart Institute. Uh, in 2007, he became the section chief of this lipoprotein metabolism laboratory, which is widely known. Uh, he is currently the director of the immunoassay and special chemistry section of the Department of Laboratory Medicine at the NIH. Uh, Alan's work has received many honors and awards. He's widely published and has made major contributions. And he's going to uh, discuss his view about this subject. Now, our second speaker uh, came to the NIH in 2012 in a rather unique position. Uh, Dr. Nihal Mehta was the first, the inaugural, Lasker Clinical Research Scholar. That's a new program started at NIH. And he came to the heart, cardiovascular, and pulmonary branch uh, in 2012. So he graduated in medicine with distinction from George Washington. And then he pursued an interesting and unique path. And I dwell on this a little bit because it deals with the question of there, there is no straight highway. <laughs> Those who take the road less traveled by, to coin a phrase, right, uh, often come up with unique ideas. And I think Nihal is a good example of it because after his medical residency at the University of Pennsylvania, he took a fellowship in cardiovascular disease and he went off to study nuclear cardiology and imaging. He did a postdoctoral fellowship in genetic epidemiology, focusing on inflammation and lipoproteins. Uh, he's had a wide experience in uh, uh, many fields, including epidemiology, basic inflammatory research, high resolution imaging technology, and it's all related to trying to understand uh, this relationship between inflammatory diseases and cardiovascular disease, and associated with that uh, sort of the, the metabolic consequences that, that take place. Uh, he made an extraordinary observation, which fascinated me when he was at Penn. Uh, you all know that psoriasis is a skin disease. Wrong. Dr. Mehta discovered that psoriasis is really an inflammatory disease and it involves much more than the skin. It's actually a systemic disease. And part of the systemic manifestations of this inflammatory, quote, skin disease is an increase, increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And this is what got him going into this. Uh, uh, into uh, cardiovascular research and what brought him here to the NIH. So, Dr. Ramali. Can uh, everyone hear me? 
So I'd like to thank everyone for uh, coming. And um, I, I would like to especially appreciate Dr. Arias. Uh, I've known him I guess, since he came to the NH, but I know of his work on the ABC transporters. And I frequently call him when I have data I don't understand, because uh, Wynn has, a, I think, a unique perspective on things. Um, so as you heard, I, I'm interested in cardiovascular disease. Um, I, I don't really study inflammation per se, but inflammation is important in many processes. So what I'm going to do today is kind of give you a crash course of cardiovascular disease and lipoprotein metabolism. What, what I do study is high-density lipoproteins, which you'll see is, you may know, so called good cholesterol. And one of the ways that may be good is by dampening inflammation. So I'm going to talk about that toward the uh, end of my talk. But hopefully th after my talk, you'll be um, well prepared to uh, hear about uh, Dr. Mendes' talk um, on inflammation atherosclerosis. But um, I took out a slide um, that, and I'm glad Wen mentioned it, so not only is cardiovascular disease, um, I think, you know, the number one killer, um, and this is, not, I guess, a trick question, but if you have breast cancer, you're more likely to die of heart disease. If you're a woman with breast cancer, you're more likely to have heart disease than breast cancer itself. Just show you how important this is. So I, like, encourage all of you to consider cardiovascular signs because it is a very, um, a very important problem. So um, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to kind of start um, just a few slides on the history of uh, cholesterol research talk about uh, uh, lipoprotein metabolism, some of the fundamentals, talk about the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis and how inflammation uh, plays a part of that. And toward the end of my talk, I'll talk about HDL and how HDL has anti-inflammatory properties and may explain part of its um, benefit in reducing atherosclerosis risk. So it's uh, hard to believe, but the, the first um, recognition of this process of atherosclerosis wasn't until about the late 1800s by Rudolf Urkow, who but you know was a, a famous um, pathologist. And it wasn't actually until after the first anatomic description of, of this process that we connected the clinical picture that we knew about sudden coronary events or death, but the connection between atherosclerotic plaque was about 25 years after the first anatomic description of, uh, of the plaque. And the connection with cholesterol goes back now a little bit over 100 years. Uh, Anichkov was a uh, a uh, officer in the Russian army, and at the time, it was very common to raise rabbits in your backyard for food, and you would feed them table scraps. And we only knew three molecules back in the turn of the last century very well um, in terms of their structure. So glucose, cholesterol, and uric acid, because those form crystals. And so you actually knew the chemical structure of those entities. So at the time, it was well known what foods were rich in cholesterol. So he very quickly fed rabbits. Um, egg yolks and discover it was, and then he, and he knew it was rich in cholesterol and discovered it was cholesterol. We know, so we've known about cholesterol now for over a hundred years. <clears throat> and then the, the next major breakthrough actually occurred here at the NIH by John Dietschy and also by uh, John Goffman. Uh, Goffman was a physicist who worked on the um, uh, Lawrence Livermore project. And he developed the analytical ultracentrifuge. John Dietschy just patched it away and developed on uh, uh, density gradient ultracentrifugation, and they kind of coined the term of high density, low density. And they realized at the time that cholesterol was carried on particles that have a low density and high density. And at the time, it was realized that cholesterol on LDL was particularly bad. And we thought eight, cholesterol on HDL was neutral. Now we realize that cholesterol on HDL is probably um, it is an indication of decreased risk. And then I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but there was a major um, conceptual breakthrough um, by Dan Steinberg in the 80s that LDL can go oxidation or modification, and that wasn't necessarily LDL itself, although that hasn't kind of proven to be fully true. But this concept that LDL also, you can unpeel the onion, and you have different fractions of LDL and different fractions of HDL that have a differential effect on atherosclerosis. And that's what we are here now in, uh, in the 2000s. Uh, the last history slide, I was going to talk about my scientific grandfather. Um, this is uh, Don Fredrickson, who, who you may have known, has gone on to do bigger and better things than what I do. But at, in the late 60s, he was a director of the lab that I lead, and he went on to become director of NIH, and he was the first hired to use uh, director. Um, and he actually um, discovered a lot of diseases that actually we still study today. Um, but one, his, his best legacies were, were the number of people that he trained. So most of them have passed away or have retired, but Tony Gatto is still active, and um, Virgil Brand, who's actually uh, kind of my, uh, one of my mentors, is, is still around. So, um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the next slides, actually, the pathways are actually were discovered here. So in regard to the pathways, 
Um, these are the particles, and I'll tell you more details about the particles as we go on, but there's different types of lipoprotein particles that I already mentioned. The largest are called chylomicrons. They're, they're large as a micron in diameter. They're produced by an intestine. And the pie chart here indicates that the red is triglycerides. So they carry mostly triglycerides or composition-wise, um, and that's why they're so light. And they, and they um, carry or they ferry uh, triglycerides from the diet uh, in, in, into the rest of the body. That the next largest particle is uh, VLDL. That's about 100 nanometers in size or slightly smaller. It's produced in the liver, and it's also a very triglyceride-rich um, particle. And then what I'm mostly going to talk about today is what I circled here in yellow, and that is uh, uh, HDL. And HDL is about 10 nanometers. It's about 50% protein, so it's essentially a protein ball, although it does have some lipids, so it's much poorer lipid content compared to the other lipoprotein particles. So this is probably in a scary way. You know, I remember in medical school when I saw like the coagulation pathway, the complement pathway, I was like, you know, decided I had to give up. So people see lipoproteins. But there's actually only three pathways, and I think it's pretty simple. You have two um, overlapping pathways, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but I already mentioned chylomicron. So you have what's called the exogenous pathway. So that's the pathway that packages dietary lipids into chylomicrons. And they transport the tri triglycerides. And the reason we have these particles is for energy delivery. They're delivering triglyceride to peripheral tissues for energy or for energy storage. And they undergo lipolysis, and then they turn into remnants, they come back. And then in the fasting state, the adipocytes hydrolyze intracellular triglycerides. Fatty acids go to liver. They're packaged into VLDL. And this also goes out to the periphery where it undergoes lipolysis. And this is converted to LDL. Most of the LDL comes back to the liver, but a little bit leaks into your vessels, and this is what causes atherosclerosis. Now, <clears throat> the other pathway I'll, I'll talk more about is this so-called uh, reverse cholesterol transport pathway, and this is mediated by the so-called good cholesterol, HDL. So what, cholesterol, what HDL does is it helps um, maintain cholesterol homeostasis. So all, all tissues can synthesize cholesterol, and cholesterol um, is, as you probably know, water and soluble, and it tends to build up. And so about eight grams of cholesterol are probably mobilized each day by HDL and return to the liver for excretion. So HDL comes in two basic flavors. You have a discoidal HDL, which is essentially a phospholipid bilayer. The main protein component is APA1, which is a tandem array, what are called amphipathic helices. I'll talk more about that later. That kind of stabilizes structure. And it's a minor component in plasma, but it's, uh, it's particularly good in removing, removing excess cholesterol from cells. And I'll explain how that works in a second. The, but the most of the HDL is in the, this form. And this is true of the other lipoproteins. Most lipoproteins are sp roughly spherical. They're essentially a micell. You have a single layer of phospholipids. And then the cargo is inside the neutral lipids, the hydrophobic lipids. That's where the cholesterol ester, in case of HDL, or triglycerides are stored for the other particles. And in case of HDL, the cholesterol esters that are formed are delivered to the liver. Now, much of what I'm going to talk about and what most people talk about, they always focus on the cholesterol content. And it's a very convenient way to measure the number of these particles. But it, it, it's important to keep in mind, and I think this has held back the field for quite a few years, these are very complex particles. They carry over 80 different proteins in case of HDL, and I'll explain why, and over 200 species of lipids. So I think we've been too focused on cholesterol, and I'll talk more about that, what, what these other lipids and proteins uh, may be important and understand your pathogens to atherosclerosis. So given the uh, compositional complexity, it's not surprising that there's lots of putative biologic functions of HDL. Um, and we don't understand uh, the, the, the true uh, clinical significance of these. But what the pathway we understand the most is what's called the reverse cholesterol transport pathway, its ability to remove cholesterol from cells. And in a few slides, I'll explain how that is linked in some way to inflammation. So this pathway begins when APA1, the main protein component that wraps around and stabilizes the scortal structure, interacts with a protein that was um, discovered um, uh, in part here by other labs across the world about 20 years ago, and it's defective in Tangier disease, a disease first described by Don Fredersen. It is the ABC1 transporter. This acquires lipid, and I'll explain how that happens later, and forms these discordal structures. They go out to the periphery where they can take additional cholesterol by macrophages in the plaque, uh, an atherosclerotic plaque by the ABC1 or by other mechanisms. And then the cholesterol, once it's removed, is trapped on the particle because LCAT is the enzyme that adds a fatty acid to it, makes it much more hydrophobic. Cholesterol is actually an amphipathic lipid. It's on the surface. 
because it has a hydroxy group. But once that's esterified, it goes into the core, and it's trapped, and it's uh, then returned to the liver uh, by uptake by the uh, SRB1 or other means, or some of it's transferred to LDL in exchange for triglyceride by CTP, and that goes back by the LDL receptor. So this is the, the full pathway. So this is how HDL extracts cholesterol. So uh, APOA1, the main protein component, could be secreted. Um, some of it's free. It also dissociates from the particles. And it's a relatively small protein, about 28,000 kilodalton. So um, it, it's rapidly filtered from the kidney. But if it can encounter a lipid domain created by the ABC transporter, we're still not sure the exact entity, what it's flipping, but it creates a lipid microdomain that causes the amphipathic helices to dissociate. And through like a detergent-like extraction process, it removes cholesterol and also phospholipid. And once you have these particles, you can also get um, movement by diffusion uh, process as well or by other means. This cholesterol, as I said before, is esterified by LCAT. It's now trapped in the core, and then it's re uh, returned to the lipid. So how does this relate to the pathogenesis of uh, atherosclerosis or, or, or inflammation? So, um, you know, I, I guess... Some of it's a, um, a semantic argument, you know, what is inflammation, you know, and I think, and I'm not going to try to answer that, but I, I think my global view, inflammation is the, is the response of the body to injury, and so it's a very broad view. So there's definitely injury to the vessel wall, uh, and the cells respond, the nearby cells respond. So the first injury is probably LDL infiltration. You don't probably develop atherosclerosis, even though LDL is not the whole story, and certainly people they have wildly different LDLs have different risks, probably related to how they respond to the LDL by the inflammatory process. But without LDL, you probably don't develop atherosclerosis, at least the way we normally think of it. So LDL is probably the, the initial insult. And um, I mentioned Dan Steinberg, and his concept was that the LDL goes, undergoes oxidation or modification. I'm not quite sure that's true. Howard Kruth here, who's a colleague of mine, has actually very nice data that there may be fluid phase pinocytosis or uptake. We still don't understand how LDL gets in. But once it gets in, it actually primes the macrophages, and they become more sensitive to inflammatory signals. And that may be because that when macrophages are gobbling up membrane, that's a signal that there's tissue damage. So that's one possible reason for that. But once the macrophages take up the LDL, um, they, they start to secrete cytokines like MCSF that cause proliferation of, of cells, including smooth muscle cells. Smooth muscle cell proliferation is a very important part of atherosclerosis. They secrete cytokines that are chemokines that attract additional um, macrophages come into the intimal space, and they uh, cause changes in the overlying endothelium. They express adhesion proteins mm -hmm. that further. So you have infiltration of LDL, which triggers greater infiltration of macrophages, and it becomes a self-sustaining, uh, perpetuating um, process. So this is early on, and this happens to everyone to a small degree. Now, um, after many years, you develop what's called a complex plaque. The, the you develop um, what is essentially is almost a, a acellular or necrotic core. You get so much lipid, some of the macrophages or cells actually die, and you start to develop a lot of extracellular lipid as well. Uh, and around the core, you can develop calcification as a part of like a wound repair process. Um, you have a fibrous cap that kind of very thin that kind of covers that, and if you that ruptures, uh, you'll see what happens in a second. That was usually the final event in atherosclerosis. And the rupture oftentimes occurs in the shoulder here. So this all happens usually in the intimal space, right underneath the endothelial cells, uh, but above the internal elastic uh, lamina. This process, as you probably know, takes many decades, usually. Uh, we all have it to some degree. If it happens in coronary vessels, this is what causes a heart attack, ischemic heart disease. A very similar process happens in the carotid, happens in all vasculature. There are differences. But depending on where you have the process, you get different disease. So it happens in your femoral, you get peripheral vascular disease. This is what it really looks like. This is a coronary vessel. <clears throat> this is a, a necrotic lipid core. You can see it's very thickened uh, due to smooth muscle cell proliferation. Um, and this is the shoulder region, probably had a rupture. And this is normally open. This is where the red cells, this is the lumen. And you can see that you have a thrombus. So the final event is you, you do have some impeding of the blood flow, which may cause angina, but the final event is actually usually a thrombus that actually completely blocks the, the blood flow. Now, um, a week or two weeks ago, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, and one of the major um, the, uh, discoveries of the Framingham Heart Study is, uh, Dr. Ari said, were risk factors. 
And this shows that LDL is positively rated with cardiovascular disease. But this wasn't, um, I think, fully appreciated. It was this, that was known, since, as I said, from John Goffman's work in the 50s. But what was clear by the mid-70s, if not earlier, that HDL is inversely related. So you can see here in this yellow bar, these patients have very high LDL cholesterol, but if you have high HDL, it seems to protect it. So this actually started this yin and yang of atherosclerosis, the so-called bad cholesterol and the good cholesterol. Um, and it's interesting, um, you need LDL to have atherosclerosis um, and HDL, um, and I think LDL trumps HDL in my opinion, uh, in terms of the process, but, um, but in terms of the risk factor, LDL is not great. Um, and, it, and this is especially true in this era because many patients, as Dr. Ari said, are on statins and you get this perverse thing when you analyze the data, they have the patients with cardiovascular disease have lower LDL cholesterol because of their own statins. But even uh, statin-naive patients, LDL cholesterol is not as good of a predictor as heart disease as HDL. That's why all the premium risk scores include HDL cholesterol, not LDL cholesterol, even though LDL cholesterol is, is our target for therapy. So why, does, why is HDL so good? So LDL infiltrates into the vessel wall. Um, the integrity of the endothelial cells is very important, as I'll talk about, because if you have good um, barrier function, you get less LDL. But once LDL infiltrates, it probably goes under some oxidation, some other modification that results in greater uptake, and you form these foam cells, which, as I said, become sensitized to inflammatory signals, and they cause this recruitment of additional monocytes uh, in into the space. Now, HDL does cholesterol efflux. It actually removes cholesterol from the foam cells through the ABC transporter, as other means. These cells, when they become full of drops, they become lazy. They don't move. When you remove cholesterol, they become more motile, and actually, they will actually move from the atherosclerotic plaque as you deload them of their cholesterol. Um, HDL also is anti-inflammatory, and I'll talk about why, um, but it seems to suppress CD11B activation monocytes. Uh, it also um, prevents uh, BCAM expression, uh, improves endothelial integrity. Uh, HDL has lots of enzymes that hydrolyze oxidized lipids and also carries vitamin E, other antioxidants. So there's multiple mechanisms by which HDL is beneficial. Which one is most important and which one we could utilize to Im improve therapy, we, we don't know at this time. Now, uh, statins are wonderful drugs, and it was a major advance um, in, in um, using statins to reduce cardiovascular disease. And um, heart disease, even though it's still very common and the most common cause, uh, has decreased dramatically in the last 20 years, thanks to all the recent discoveries. Um, but we haven't, we still have a way to go. So what most people don't realize is statins, under the best of circumstances, reduce events by about 30%. That is, patients are on clinical trials or compliant. A lot of times people aren't compliant, they go off meds. And so in practice, statins probably aren't even achieving this. Now, there are some new drugs, such as PCSK9 inhibitors, that may lower LDL a little bit more, and they may perhaps reduce events even more. But because of the fact that we're not, we haven't solved heart disease with statins, there were some early trials that use combination drugs. They do many things, but one of the combinations oftentimes raise HDL. So this generated a lot of enthusiasm 10, 15, 20 years ago. It suggests that maybe we can stop um, atherosclerosis. We had a combination of lowering LDL and raising HDL. And um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, during this talk, but unfortunately, um, it's been very disappointing so far. Um, there's been a lot of effort to try to raise HDL, and the focus is mostly on HDL cholesterol, and I'll talk more about that. That may have misled us, but so far, we don't really have good drugs that raise HDL that seem to do much more than what we can do with statins at this time. But I'm still convinced that there, we still need to research this area to understand how HDL is working. So a little about HDL inflammation. So, so I, I thought about um, how could HDL um, uh, interfere with the inflammatory process and in terms of what we know, what, what we think HDL does. So what we th one of the things we think HDL does is promote cholesterol removal. And it mostly uh, removes cholesterol from cells, but HDL, as you'll see in a second, may have an impact also on extracellular uh, cholesterol as well. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I think Dr. Nihal is going to talk a little about this LPS, and I'll throw in a few slides. But HDL also can, can sequester bad things, so it can, can sequester oxidized lipids. If they're important, that may be beneficial. It can sequester endotoxin, I'll show a little bit. And then there was recent data from John Kane, who was presented at the AHA meeting, it's not published yet, and I'll talk more about this later. But as I mentioned, HDL binds a lot of proteins. It turns out a lot of the cytokines are bound to HDL. 
So whether that suppressors or helps deliver, we don't know. But there's a possible internet connection between cytokines and HDL itself. And then finally, um, I said HDL is very com has a very complicated cargo. So it has some of the cargo is anti-inflammatory, as you'll see, and that may be how it's um, beneficial. So in regard to cholesterol efflux, so this is a, a peptide that um, that uh, um, people in my lab are, are working on, and we were developed it as a tool to understand APOA1. Um, it's a bihelical peptide, and it's designed to be amphipathic. So this peptide has uh, amino acids arranged on one side are hydrophobic and on one side hydrophilic, and that's what means amphipathic. The hydrophobic side is what allows it to bind to lipoproteins or lipid. And what uh, our lab has found and uh, other people who, who work on these um, similar peptides have found that they have very potent uh, anti-atherosclerotic effects, at least in animal models. Um, and this is an APOE knockout mice. This is the uh, arch of aorta, and you can see stain with ORIDO. And a mouse treated with the peptide helps mobilize the lipid, actually could remove um, atherosclerotic plaque. And this has uh, generated a lot of interest in using HDL self as an infusion therapy, which are still some ongoing clinical trials to test. So one of the things the HDL does, and you can actually get a very similar result with HDL with the peptide. Now, if you take that peptide or HDL and you incubate it with macrophages that you stimulate with LPS, one of the things you'll notice is that it suppresses TNF-alpha release. Or if you take uh, whole blood, human blood, and you stimulate with a lectin because receptor coupling it, that normally causes all kinds of cytokines to release, and you can suppress that with the peptide or with HDL. And you can also do that with cyclodextran. So cyclodextran is a polymer of glucose that removes cholesterol. So wh why, why is this? Why, why are you turning off inflammation when you remove cholesterol? And I, I don't have the answer for that. But as I said, one possibility is that macrophages are probably primed whenever they have to encounter debris, cellular debris, membranes. And the engulfment of lipid may be a signal or like a danger signal for that. The other possibility which I, I favor is that cholesterol is very important in many different biologic processes. And the uh, plasma membrane is about 50 mole percent cholesterol. And to have receptor signaling, you need the right amount of cholesterol. So if you modulate the cholesterol on the cellular membrane, the, the, the signaling is different. And inflammation is the active process. It doesn't happen passively. You need live cells, there's a machinery working. And if you modulate that by HDL, perhaps that's how it's uh, dampening inflammation. But anyway, this is a common observation that inflammation is dampened um, when you treat cells with HDL, and it may relate in part to removal of cholesterol. Now, I talk about cellular cholesterol. So this is a, another disease that um, uh, Care Norm in Norway discovered, there was also a lot of early work done here at the NIH, is LCAT deficiency. And um, this is an example of uh, extracellular deposition of cholesterol. So these patients are missing that enzyme that esterifies cholesterol, and they get cholesterol deposited in the cornea of their eyes. If you have partial deficiency, it's called fish eye disease. You can see you have these clouded cornea. If you have complete deficiency, you get the corneal findings, but you also get um, renal disease, and you get deposits of cholesterol in the kidney and you have very low HDL, and they have an abnormal part called LPX. So normally, lipoproteins are micelles, single layer phospholipids, but if you can't esterify cholesterol, these, part, these excess lipids reorganize as vesicles. So they have bilayer or multilamellar structure that are about 50, 34, 30 to 40 mole percent cholesterol and phospholipid. And these are the particles that get trapped uh, in these different tissues. <clears throat> and what we found uh, at Newfield in my laboratory has made synthetic LPX particles, and they trigger uh, inflammation and renal damage. They get deposited just like the endogenous particles, uh, but only in the LCAT knockout mice. And we've tried to develop this as a therapy as, uh, for these patients with rare genetic disorder, and we can actually dissolve the LPX particles uh, with the LCAT. And it causes proteinuria, much like our, we see in our patients. So why is deposition of LPX um, bad? So um, this is unpublished data, but one of the things that we found is that if you treat macrophages with LPX, it uh, makes them, um, activates the inflammasome. You get IL-1 beta secretion. Uh, but it's not just phospholipid vesicles. You have to have the cholesterol there, which is, you know, I, I think, again, um, d membrane debris is probably bad, but it's not simple. Phospholipid vesicles won't do it. It's the cholesterol. So that was very curious to us. It destabilizes lysosomes, perhaps because of cholesterol uh, crystal formation inside the cell. 
But the other clue we find is that it causes complement fixation. This is the C3B that is attached to the LPX particles, and this can prime cells to um, activate the various inflammatory processes. So why are we fixing complement? And we also discovered in our patients, they have fixation of complement in, in the kidney, not by the, uh, the classic pathway involving immunoglobulins, but by the alternative pathway. So as I mentioned, there's two pathways to fix complement. You can fix it with uh, immunoglobulin, or you can fix it just by directly fixing C3. And C3 has a very reactive thioester bond, which will attach to hydroxyl groups or amino groups. And the only thing that it could attach to is this hydroxyl group here. Um, and so we made LPX particles out of colostane with missing that uh, hydroxyl group or colostane, or colostane, and it does not fix complex. So we think it's the hydroxyl group and the accumulation of cholesterol that is causing the problems. And then probably more importantly, because it's more um, uh, generally true, you do get cholesterol crystals per se in atherosclerotic plaque. And we used to thought that was a late phenomena. But uh, Eric Latz, who's done the most work in this area, has shown that very early on, you see extracellular cholesterol deposits. Uh, and those are very inflammatory. It's just in the same way that uric acid crystals are very inflammatory, any kind of physical crystalline material is very um, re uh, reactive um, because, um, again, the macrophages respond to that. So what we found, Seth Thacker um, in my laboratory, showed that indeed, um, as described by others, cholesterol crystals will activate the inflammasome, increase alum beta, but HDL lowers it. So we, at the time, thought this was due to an effect of HDL solubilizing the crystals, and that happens to a small degree, but I don't think that's what we're saw. What we saw is that the signal, um, you need to have pro IL-1 beta to be made. You have to have the macrophages primed, um, and then when you have a insult, you get cleavage of the pro IL-1 beta by caspases, but these cells have decreased pro IL-1 beta when you treat HDL, and we think that, again, it has to do with the signal coupling between the plasma membrane uh, and the signals. So I'm not, I'm not going to say a lot about this. Um, uh, Dr. Amato is going to talk about endotoxin. So endotoxin is a lipid. It has lots of acyl chains. And there's still, um, there was more interest, but there's still great interest in HDL uh, for sepsis. And the reason is HDL will sequester and neutralize endotoxin. Much the same way that HDL removes cholesterol, it also removes phospholipid, any lipophilic molecule. So these are actually patients with low and high HDL. The high HDL patients had an average uh, HDL cholesterol about 60 versus I think it was 30 um, by John Castlin's group. And the patients with high HDL don't develop neutrophilia, um, but they also don't develop very high cytokines in, in, in contrast to patients with low HDL. And the other reason I bring this up is there's a new theory that you have low amounts of endotoxin, not only from sepsis, but you have endotoxin exposure from your gut, from the microbiome, and you have so-called leaky gut. So this may be the low level of endotoxin that may be triggering uh, inflammation. And HDL by sequestering it perhaps is beneficial. So the very last thing I'd like to talk about is the, the, the rest of the cargo besides cholesterol and HDL and how this may be mediating some of the beneficial effects of HDL. So uh, Jay Heineke at the uh, 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 University of Washington had a major discovery in 2007 showing that besides APA1, which accounts for about 70% of the protein mass, uh, there's many other proteins that are loosely, usually loosely attached. And so HDL is a small particle, has a high rate of curvature. Because of that, the phospholipids don't pack. So if you have even a small loop, a hydrophobic loop, it will like to insert that loop into the HDL. So in much the same way that albumin is the main carrier of lipophilic small molecules, HDL seems to have a corona of proteins that are loosely attached most of the time, some more tightly related to the insertion of hydrophobic loops uh, into the HDL. And what this means, and, and if they're important, we don't fully understand, but there's tantalizing data su suggesting that these may modulate the function of HDL. So one example is serum amyloid A, which is a acute phase reactant. It will, as it goes up, it actually binds to HDL, and it seems to neutralize the ability of HDL to efflux. So that's um, work of Nancy Webb and others. So that's one example. So um, this is work from um, our laboratory, um, by Scott um, Gordon. Uh, Scott has used the mass spec cleavable crosslinkers, and we're kind of looking at the interactome map of how these proteins. But the other thing that Scott did was um, uh, a, a study that I think is probably why Wynn invited us here was a famous study done by Paul Ricker, the so called Jupiter study, where they had patients with low LDL, 
uh, but high CRP. And they treated them with statins, and they, and they benefited, which you know, people think doesn't make sense, because statins lower LDL. Why would these people benefit? So this was actually now almost 10 years ago, but suggested that um, statins themselves may be anti-inflammatory. So we asked this question, well, what else do statins do that besides lowering LDL? So we thought, well, let's look at the proteome of HDL, because we know HDL seems to have anti-inflammatory effects. And what Scott found is that there was remarkable upregulation of alpha-1 and trypsin on HDL. So alpha-1 and trypsin, as you know, is a large member of what's called the serpent family. It's a protease inhibitor. And it turns out there's 10 other, or 9 or 10 other serpents that are attached to HDL. And the way it attaches is it has the hydrophobic loop, which is actually the bait for the protease. And that is what inserts uh, into the particle. And we um, did that by modeling. We all done cryo-electron microscopy. You can see the alpha-1 trypsin attached to the HDL. Interestingly, there's several methionines that relatively get oxidized in this loop. And once they're oxidized, alpha trypsin doesn't work. So the methionines are buried and protected. So what we found, <clears throat> oh, let me back up. So why is that important? So alpha and trypsin does inhibit, does inhibit trypsin, but trypsin is not normally present in the plasma. Trypsin is an enzyme that's secreted for, for digestion and the lumen of the gut. But the, the main target of um, uh, alpha and trypsin is probably elastase. So it's a, a related protease. And elastase is produced by activated macrophages, neutrophils is released. And one thing the elastase do is, is they, they nibble on the so-called protease activated receptors. And the protease activated receptors are everywhere, and that usually triggers, uh, triggers inflammation. So what we did here is we had uh, macrophages. We treated uh, in, in this um, black here with elastase, and that induced uh, TNF alpha secretion. So, um, Pre-incubation of the HDL suppresses it, and if you enrich HDL with alpha and trypsin, it will almost completely abrogate this response. Free alpha and trypsin did not work very well, and the reason is those two methionines, if they're exposed, they get very quickly inactivated by oxygen radicals produced by white cells. So the idea is that the alpha and trypsin is kind of protected and to do its job. And then, uh, actually, before our paper came out, a group in France had a, um, who works on uh, pulmonary disease, you may know. Alpha and trypsin deficiency, one of the common problems is emphysema due to breakdown of elastin uh, in, in the lung. And they found that alpha and trypsin, if you, uh, there's, a, there's, there's alpha and trypsin therapy, it doesn't question how well it works, but if you pre-complex in at least a rat model, uh, alpha and trypsin HDL works far better, probably because it's protecting alpha and trypsin, it's maybe also delivering it there. So this is an example how HDL may be delivering a cargo that may be modulating uh, inflammation. So again, uh, elastase is produced by activated macrophages. It breaks down basic membrane proteins that may cause this plaque rupture. It also uh, prevents, uh, can activate inflammation through signal through um, protease activated receptors on endothelial cells and other cells. And we think HDL may suppress that. And this is, uh, Scott is leaving my lab, and this is a project he's going to take with him. Uh, and the very last few slides, um, I talked, you know, again, most people talk about cholesterol, but it carries many different lipids. Uh, and I'll just say a little about sphingosine 1-phosphate. So sphingosine 1-phosphate, there's a lot of nice work done here at NH by Rick Proya, uh, and also by uh, Roke Nofer, both of who which are, are friends of mine, Roke's at the University of Munster, and they showed that um, the most of H S1P circulating is bound to HDL, and that it's uh, delivered to the S1P receptors, and it mediates all these wonderful effects that can impact the atherosclerosis. And people are now um, interested in developing stable analogs of S1P as a treatment for uh, atherosclerosis. And the only work we've done in this area, we've looked at the S1P content of HDL in patients for, with, from the Coburn City Heart Study that had either high or low HDL with or without heart disease, uh, open versus dark. And you can see that patients that have higher S1P content had a, a lower incidence of uh, heart disease. And then um, uh, this is um, actually was done in collaboration with uh, Scott R. Graves. And Scott um, deserves all the credit for this. So Scott works on endothelial cells, and we found that delivering S1P to HDL improves endothelial barrier function, which then may prevent LDL infiltration. So finally, um, these are the major questions I think are in the HDL field. Is it involved in the pathogenesis of heart disease? And I think for sure it is, although there's some skeptics now that the clinical trials that rage HDL cholesterol haven't worked. But I think we have to be open to the possibility it may be doing more than just cholesterol reflux, or that may not be the whole story. Should we measure it? It's certainly still a very good marker uh, for measuring it. And there's nice work by Dan Rader showing that there may be other ways to measure it, such as the function of HDL, 
which are better predictors than the cholesterol content of HDL. Is it a therapy or just a biomarker? So given the, the recent failures of clinical trials, that uh, multiple drugs that raise HDL cholesterol with different pathways, I think one has to be very careful going forward in the future using it as a target of therapy. But we may um, have to um, use measure other functions of HDL and in terms of developing drugs that modulate HDL for reducing cardiovascular disease. So I think uh, the bottom line is we need to know more about HDL. We need to do more careful composition function studies. And despite the recent um, disappointments, um, I th think it's still a valuable area of research. And more, not less, is needed if we're going to ever harness the potential of HDL for reducing heart disease. Um, and these are the uh, people, some of which have left my lab, uh, in, in the lab. And I just, I'll answer questions after, when, or before. I gather that HDL is sort of a garbage can for hydrophobic molecules of any sort. Correct. Is there any specificity? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned briefly our, our work on peptides, and w we are very interested in designing peptides that would land on things besides HDL. But like most of our amphipathic peptides, they always seem to prefer HDL, and I think that relates to the biophysics of the curvature. Um, there's probably some protein-protein interactions, uh, maybe with the APOE1 itself, and there may be some specificity, but um, I haven't found it yet. Um, so I, I know if I would say it's a garbage can, but... Um, no, that wasn't intended for you, but uh, <laughs> what about hydrophobic drugs? Um, yeah, so there is a hydro... Well, the hydro hydrophobic drugs also, you know, bind to albumin, but some do bind um, to lipoproteins as well. Um, you know, there are physical differences um, between the lipids on the surface of LDL and HDL um, and also the core. So there's probably some differences, but not a lot of difference. I think the main difference is the size of the particles. And um, I think related to the high rates of curvature, at least peptides actually prefer to bind to HDL, in my experience. One other part of that. Recently in science, there was a claim that uh, lipids produce, that bacterial produced lipids end up in plaque. Yes. Is that a Trumpism or is it true? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that, well, certainly, as I mentioned, that there's this new hypothesis that we're all, in, even in the absence of sepsis, we're all exposed to low-dose endotoxin. Um, endotoxin, because it's lipophilic, tends to cross membranes. And so probably, it's probably from the gut flora, but maybe other sources, maybe the mouth. And, and so we all have low-dose endotoxin, and they may, while we all have a smoldering level of inflammation, um, and that was one hypothesis how HDL is beneficial. So um, the plaque is very lipophilic. It actually has pure lipid when you have the cholesterol. So lots of lipophilic things end up there. So, um, so that is, a, a, it is true that there is a, um, bacterial and the toxins present yeah, in plaque. Okay. <clears throat> there you go. So uh, HDL is not such a good guy. So. And the amount of the HDL is always much less. I guess as I was following my HDL LDL profile, I see I had about 100 milligram of LDL per deciliter versus about 40 milligram. So it looks like the, my HDL is going down. So is there any way lower level of HDL could counteract the beneficial bad things of the LDL? Lower levels of HDL? HDL is always lower. You, your HDL. Well, well, I mean, I think, again, you know, gets to what I said earlier, is, as you probably know, we measure HDL and LDL by the cholesterol content, and that, that can be misleading. So if you do it like on a molar basis, there's about 30 to 40 more times HDL particles than LDL. But when you look at the cholesterol content, their capacity to carry cholesterol, usually there's much more cholesterol on LDL versus HDL. Um, most of the data shows higher HDL is beneficial from an epidemiologic standpoint. Um, but there is also recent data suggests that, like many things in life, um, maybe too much of HDL is bad, and, and that maybe not all the HDL is equally good. So people with extreme levels of HDL may not be uh, have the protection you might think. But in general, uh, low HDL is bad, and um, and it's oftentimes associated with high TG and high LDL cholesterol. And to sort out which is the cause and which is a marker, we we, we still don't know yet. 
Okay, Alan, let me ask you a question. Uh, internists and cardiologists, and they'll measure something like uh, a C-reactive protein. Uh, and if it's elevated, they give all sorts of advice about what you should do for your heart. Right. I find that very puzzling. I can see if you have other problems with your heart. But so that's first question. What, what, what does it mean if somebody has no? The second thing is uh, not so very long. Well, yeah, it was a long time ago for many of you. Uh, what we now call autoimmune diseases were blamed on something called chronic inflammation. And people had their gallbladders removed and their appendices removed and all kinds of their dent to their teeth, you know, all kinds of stuff to reduce the chronic inflammation, which was postulated to be the basis of things like rheumatoid arthritis and so right. forth. And I'm sort of curious. We <laughs> this all seems to come back again, that it's tied in with the first question I asked you. Well, what does it mean if somebody has chronic inflammation but doesn't have any heart disease? Is that a risk factor? I, I'm going to let Dr. Mehta answer that one because I, I think that's right up his alley. Okay. So we'll let Dr. But, but, uh, but I'll say something quickly about the first one. Um, so I, 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 you know, there is skepticism about the utility of CRP as a marker. Um, particularly in Europe, um, maybe less so here. And um, but my my view, um, it's just my view, and, and I'm not an expert in this area, in, in the CRP area. But my view is that we undertreat heart disease, um, and many patients um, on statins go off them. Um, we're not treating everyone who can benefit from statins, and there's also a very large number of people who at at an intermediate risk that you can go both ways. Or and and I think CRP is valuable. Um, for people at intermediate risk, and, and in the same way, some other more advanced testing. So I think if you have clear heart disease, no matter what your LDL is, you want to own statins. If, if you're a triathlete and you're a woman, you have no risk factors, you know, your CRP. But if, you, if you're if you more like... Some of them drop dead of a heart attack. That's true. You know. yeah. <laughs> but if you're like most of us, you have your intermediate risk. And and I, I think CRP, I, I, my review of the data is that CRP does help. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a one part of a, the tool to help you decide. And and if it and encourages more people to go on on to, to drugs, I think that's, that's probably beneficial. Okay. Well, thank you yeah. very very much, and we can ask more questions after Dr. Mehta is. Well, you know, it's interesting. Thank you for having me. I was um, I think recommended for this talk by Alan, and I was sitting up front taking more notes than I usually take at any talk, which just goes to show that I learn things um, from. Alan all the time, and I really am honored to be here to speak to you about this. Now, what I was asked to do was really think about whether uh, inflammation is causal for heart disease. That was what the charge was. Alan took the inflammatory HDL route, and I'm going to take the inflammatory sort of route in humans, and I am a cardiologist by training, as Wynn said. So this is a little bit of a, I do believe it's causal debate, uh, if you will. So I'm going to present a few lines of evidence. But before I begin to talk formally, I just want to make sure everybody understands that it's called cardiometabolic diseases. It is not metabolic syndrome. So when I bring up cardiometabolic diseases, it's a combination of vascular diseases and metabolic diseases. So I lead the section of inflammation and cardiometabolic diseases. And what those are, anything on this slide, so whether it's subclinical or clinical athero, whether it's insulin resistance or glucose dysglycemia, um, obesity, or high cholesterol. The reason this was done is it encompasses an easier way for a provider to tell a patient you have cardiometabolic diseases rather than you have cardiovascular disease, you have cerebral disease, you have metabolic disease. So cardiometabolic diseases will come up fairly often. I'm not going to go through a lot of the slides that I have here, which is great, because then I can get to the stuff I really want to talk about. Alan talked about this already. Atherosclerosis is a disease of inflammation. It starts with a vessel wall that is non-inflamed, and in the right setting, whether it be uh, periodontal disease, uh, skin disease, or obesity, or smoking, 
inflammation and its mediators start attracting messengers that begin this process that ends in an unfortunate amount of people, that's one in five, are going to get plaque rupture and superimposing thrombus and heart attack. And inflammation is critical along this whole pathway. So I believe that you need inflammation to start this. We know epidemiologically that when you have high levels of LDL, this is in 10,000 women followed for 10 years, you have a twofold risk of future heart disease. Here in this study, when you had inflammation measured by high sensitivity C-reactive protein, you had a fourfold risk of future events. So something in 2002, 15 years ago, suggested inflammation led to CV events in apparently healthy women. This became so important that about 10 years later in 12, when I came to NIH, these two trials started. And the one on your right is now done, the IL-1 beta inhibitor trial, and that is called Cantos. Let me walk you through this because this is now why it's easy for me to end the talk a half hour early and say I believe inflammation is causal because the trial on your right really gave a lot of uh, kind of argument uh, or, or weight to the argument. So what is the trial? So basically, if you've had an MI, you were randomized to something that stopped the inflammasome activation. So Alan brought up IL-1 beta. So this is an IL-1 beta inhibitor used in rare diseases. And they brought it out to those who had an MI. And 15,000 people were in this study. And in August, they released that the groups that were treated with 300 versus placebo had a 15% reduction in their second heart attack. So this is people who was maximally already treated, first heart attack, they're on maximal medical therapy, and what do we do? We know they're our highest risk population. 45% will have another event. So what we did here was ask, was it inflammation? So I wave my hands a bit and say, IL-1 beta inhibition worked. We have no idea how. Keeps us in business for another decade for sure because nobody knows why this worked. The trial on your left is 5,500 people. Wave your hands a little bit more. Methotrexate is a nonspecific T cell inhibitor. And they are randomizing somebody with a myocardial infarction who's on good medicines and randomizing them to very low dose methotrexate versus placebo. That is now 5,500 uh, strong, or power to 5,500, it's about 3,500 strong. So it'll be ready to publish or ready to go with results in probably three years, okay? So these trials are $1 billion that people believe inflammation is causal. The trial on your right was $880 million cheap by Novartis. The trial on your left is $88 million by NHLBI extramural. So not bad, right? We can actually do a trial for a little less money, but it's gonna take five times as long to recruit. So I'm going to now, with that background, saying I believe it's causal, I'm gonna to try to make some arguments why. So I, I utilize a human model. Since I've arrived at NHLBI, I do use some preclinical models, but I'm not gonna show you any of those data because the human as a model system has a different immune system and really has a different way of looking at the development of heart disease. I learned from Alan, one of the first facts that I learned from Alan when I arrived here trying to derive my preclinical program is mice don't get atherosclerosis. Actually, a mouse is not going to get athero unless you do something to it. And that started making me think as well, humans are a good model system. So I would urge you, if you really are trying to make an argument for a human program and a grant to look at these two papers, the second paper actually went through how many responses down to sepsis, um, down to different places along the path, sepsis, burns, trauma, that the human equivalent of the immune response was diametrically the opposite of the mouse's human response. So again, we need certain times where we utilize a human model. So ideally, you would have a association studied when a model would be non-inflamed and then modulated to an inflamed state, and in this inflamed state, pathways of interest that were discussed by Dr. Romale can be tested for modulation. So my next 10 minutes, maybe a little less, are gonna be about this model of giving endotoxin to a human being. And I did this in over 300 individuals before coming to the NIH, it's safe. We've given varying doses of this. And here's the broad hypothesis. We would be able to study human cardiometabolic diseases in this setting. Uh, and the actual endotoxemic state, once you get someone there, 
man, it really resembles cardiometabolic diseases. Like if you took an obese person with insulin resistance, they look like so, and I just gave a little bit of LPS too. Fascinating. So the studies I'm going to go over are, I think, two in the LPS model, and then I'm going to turn to a chronic disease, just so you have an idea of what I'm going to talk about. This was my conceptual diagram of our first R01 on the outside in 2006. I'm not going to take you through it. But we use endotoxin to probe TLR4 on adipocytes and, and monocytes, which are accessible tissues. And we use this pathway down, which we know leads to cardiovascular events. And we're using these two cells as a window to understand how inflammation modulates these processes. My study protocol is probably too long to describe, but it was basically healthy humans screened four to six weeks for a diet run-in period looking for obesity. We then have them go on a standard diet. We measure for fat. We give them two weeks on an AHA step one diet. We admit them. We bring them in. We give them saline the first day. We get their blood and their tissue. On the second day at the ripe hour of 6 a.m., just to control for circadian rhythm, we give LPS at three nanograms per kilogram, and we repeat everything. We had insulin sensitivity done here, here, and here. So we have three different tests for insulin sensitivity. The baseline characteristics, this was just a bunch of healthy college students from Penn. They came in, they got some LPS, they did well. It was a safe procedure and safe protocol. This showed me how hard human research was um, because there was a lot of variability, but a properly powered study controlled for that. And here's some data. You give them LP, you do nothing, nothing is happening in the blood. Very low levels of um, inflammatory leukocyte mRNA, low levels of plasma proteins, low levels in the adipose of TNF and IL-6. This is subcutaneous gluteal adipose taken from the butt cheek. Um, and then after you give some LPS, you will get this inflammatory response. Lo and behold, TNF-alpha, IL-6, a lot of innate immune cytokines. And what was so incredibly you know, I think eye-opening to me at that point was the adipose got inflamed. Their adipose actually at 4, 12, and 24 hours continued to express TNF-alpha and IL-6. You'll see the IL-6 spikes up and goes away. And this was probably, now looking back, pro-inflammatory macrophages that are now being all turned on by the LPS. What was so interesting was we first questioned, before we got into the insulin stuff, RCT inflammation and HDL. I'm not going to go through this, and this reminds me to ask Alan for his beautiful slides, because this is my concept of reverse cholesterol transport that Alan just eloquently went through. It's basically a, a macrophage loaded with cholesterol makes its way back for the HDL to deposit cholesterol into your poop. So it gets excreted in the feces, okay? And we showed at that time, after LPS, that you had this decrement of about 3 to 5% on average of HDL function. And I didn't throw the slides in here, but this was actually something that recovered fairly quickly, but it still took some time. I think it was by 36 hours we started seeing recovery. So inflammation retards HDL function in healthy humans. So pretty good observation, right? But still a surrogate marker. What about insulin resistance? I am not going to go through this, especially on a 5 o'clock on a work afternoon, because it'll put you to sleep if you're not asleep already. But insulin is a very complicated molecule. It comes in and it binds the um, receptor. The GLUT4 gets moved up once the insulin is bound. And this happens with insulin receptor substrate. Tyrosine phosphorylation stimulates this. And in the presence of anything in red, this process slows down. And so endotoxin via TLR4, TNF-alpha via TNF receptor, these can have a direct serine phosphorylation, which retards the GLUT4 going to the cell. These can actually go to the nucleus and transcribe all more pro-inflammatory cytokines. Also, suppressors of cytokine signaling, SOX, those can go in and bombard the insulin receptor substrate. So this is insulin resistance at a cellular level. Well, what happened to our healthy humans? At, at saline, nothing happened. And then by one day, post-LPS, they've become insulin resistant as much as diabetics. And it was definitely something that affected their insulin sensitivity, and it did not change their beta cell function. So that was a key question by the reviewer, that did you have a beta cell change? No, this was not beta cell, this was peripheral. And in addition, that astounding thought or discovery that it was the adipose tissue, the adipose insulin receptor went down, the AKT2 went down, the insulin receptor substrate went down, and SOX3, that suppressor of cytokine signaling went up, 
everything made the adipose insulin resistant as well. So another neat little sort of follow um, query. Now, at that moment, you should say, wow, this is great. I've now proven something. No, I haven't. It's, it's not causal yet. It's temporally related. We always, in our lab, go back to Koch's postulates, what makes causality, seven things. Temporal sequence was only number three, right? You still have a lot more to do. But what I learned in 2007 from this set of studies was writing grants is really hard. And writing papers is really hard because everybody kept saying, yeah, your model works, but it may not represent true in vivo inflammation. It could be a comp compensatory response, it could be a stress response. So at that moment, it was 2007, I had had my, you know, sort of, it's a little bit of like a, a deflation at that moment because we had the paper put out, but no grants were actually getting funded. So I'm riding an elevator with my smile on and my heart on, kind of uh, my cardiology heart on at, at, at Penn. And I bumped into somebody who actually asked me, are you interested in studying inflammation and heart disease? I said, I am, why do you ask? And he says, because you have a, a cardiology lab coat on and you're young enough where inflammation may actually mean something to you. It was a very nice way of asking me. So lo and behold, this dermatologist became my 10 year, decade long companion from that one elevator ride. And I'm gonna tell you about what the human studies are. So could there be a chronic inflammatory human state that I looked at? And I don't know why my picture didn't come through, but I usually have a big picture of psoriasis right here. But this dermatologist was the one who discovered, Wynn gave me this very nice introduction. But I actually co-discovered that psoriasis really caused MI or associated with MI. I would say 10 years later it might be causal, but let's go through some of that now. Psoriasis is an inflammatory skin disease. When I was a medical student just about 10 years, 12 years ago, it was itchy, scaly skin, that's all, cosmetic. It's common, but this last part, there's a billion immune cells that are activated in a flare. This comes by way of a conceptual model put together with a student of mine in the crowd. And we look at basically psoriasis as a model of systemic inflammation. I would actually change this now and call it an immune cell signature and metabolic dysfunction with accelerates atherosclerosis. So here's our conceptual model, why psoriasis may link inflammation, immune activation, and metabolic dysfunction. Why? Well, the first discovery that was brought up tonight was the fact that when you have psoriasis, you actually have a heart attack risk that is about 58% elevated when it's severe. The graph here on the right shows when you have psoriasis in blue, you have five years of life lost. And when you're 40 or 50, about that decade, you have a two-fold increase of having a heart attack when you have psoriasis. That's pretty astounding. That's why JAMA published this in 2006. So I told you that it was around 2007 and a half that I met this collaborator, but over the next three years, I spent my time really convincing myself that psoriasis impacted heart disease. Because before I launched my whole career in a direction, I wanted to make sure that there was a real epidemiolo epidemiological signal, which is why I did my two years of postdoctorate work in epidemiology. And you'll see here that pound for pound at every adjustment, psoriasis increases CVD by 40 to 60%. I'm not gonna go through this because this is gonna be covered down the line when I get to some coronary imaging, but there's immune factors that relate psoriasis to atherosclerosis. A dendritic cell activates, differentiates into a helper T cell or a 17 cell, goes back to the skin cell, and the skin cell becomes a factory of things that we just talked about as inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. So now is the point where it gets fun because we've convinced you, hopefully, that Inflammation is important in metabolic diseases. Psoriasis is this chronic disease with inflammation, and it provides a model to understand causality. And this last bullet is important. We are able to use FDA-approved therapies in psoriasis that are anti-TNF, anti-IL-17, anti-IL-1223. So if any of those interest you, this is a group of patients who come in, we treat them with these disease, these agents, and we can study what it is in a human by picking off these pathways. So the first level of evidence is systemic inflammation is pretty rampant in psoriasis, and it resembles having a heart attack. So this is real heart attack. This is what we call non-cardiac chest pain. And when you have psoriasis, you have about a nine-fold elevation of TNF-alpha compared to ACS, and you have a five-fold elevation of inflammatory uh, IL-1 beta. Very interesting, just the systemic inflammatory state. 
These are graphs generated in help with Allen's lab, actually. And it shows that when you have psoriasis, you have more ApoB and you have more small LDL, which is oxidized. And Alex in the crowd here is studying that in my lab. You have this ApoB shift. And when you looked at reverse cholesterol transport, there's about a 15% decrement in what Alan was talking about, about cholesterol efflux. So is this a human model to study cardiac inflammatory diseases? So here's an interesting slide that we can spend 30 seconds on. So I study psoriasis here at the NHLBI, and how do I do that? I have three protocols. The first one is my flagship protocol, it's psoriasis. Anybody with psoriasis comes in, 18 to no age limit, um, they get screened for making sure they have psoriasis. They come back, they get imaged, they get imaged, and they come back for four years, and we have about 100 now back at four-year follow-up. We have 300 at baseline, and we have 150 uh, followed at one year. We deeply phenotype all of them. We get PET-CT, PET-MRI, and coronary CTA. We get blood for all of the things we just talked about, and we get tissue in about 20% of the individuals. We compare these findings to another protocol of healthy individuals, diabetics, and patients with coronary disease. And I really need to update this slide because we now have a one-year follow-up in these patients to compare this one-year follow-up. So the last five or seven minutes of the talk are probably the most fun because I'm going to show you data from these cohorts. The reason I spend a little bit of time on these slides is if you are interested, I forgot to tell you that in the back of this right here, the most common cause of death here of this life lost was CVD. But the other two most common causes of death in this population, so it's 25% CVD and about 15% cancer and 10% infection. So if infection, cancer, or CVD interest you, this is a very interesting protocol. And there's a lot of bank specimens and a lot of bank tissues. And all these images I'm about to show you come from the cohort. So I'm going to go through quickly vascular imaging, and we're just going to focus on the coronaries. But basically, all of these patients get inflammatory burdens in their aorta, and they get coronary CTA. The first finding I'm going to show you is what you see on the outside, how severe their psoriasis is, what you see on the inside. It's how inflamed their aortas are. So vascular inflammation is directly related to how bad their skin disease is. Pretty interesting one-to-one -one relationship. And when you look at these people, they have vascular inflammation that is similar to those with conventional CVD. So if you wanted to look up this Lancet trial, the entry criteria for this study was a target to background ratio of vascular inflammation of 1.6. Our psoriasis patients are walking around with that all the time. So here's psoriasis and here is a control. And really what you see is this tremendous amount of abnormal vascular activity in the aorta. We don't know if this is vasculitis, if this is atherosclerosis. I'm going to posit at this point, it doesn't matter. It's vascular inflammation, it's vascular injury. But when you have somebody, so I have a protocol where I can recruit someone who just had a heart attack, their vascular inflammation looks just like psoriasis. So if CVD and inflammation share common pathways, human, 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 you're still seeing this abnormal amount of vascular rinding in those who just had a heart attack. So finally, the most exciting three minutes. If these are truly related entities, psoriasis representing inflammation, CVD representing an atherosclerosis, might their coronaries be affected? Okay, so coronary CT angiography is a way I can take a picture of your heart without ever entering with a needle or a catheter. It is basically a cardiac CT where we give some contrast and we can get pretty pictures like this. And I'm going to take you through how we do this, just because I think at this hour, um, it's actually nice to have a little audio, audio visual. Um, so what we do is we inject dye, we give a little bit of nitroglycerin, and we give a little bit of beta blocker, we slow the heart rate down. We then have a 3D reconstruction where here we're able to look at the heart in every sort of tomographic view, axially as well as tomographically, and we can make the manubrium and the osha structures disappear. And so while we're making the manubrium and the osha structures disappear, we can focus on one particular uh, vessel. And here that particular vessel is the LAD. The LAD goes all the way down to the apex. And what I ask my fellows to do is follow the ACC AHA model of rep reporting coronary segments. And what we are left with after this uh, video plays is we're left with basically four views of the artery. And I'm going to put that in a cartoon format for you. 
Um, in those four vessels of the artery, we can actually see how thick the artery is with atherosclerosis. And this slide demonstrates that psoriasis patients have a 12% increase in their arteries. These are age and gender match controls. And of that arteriosclerosis, most of it is non-calcified. That non-calcified plaque, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, all of these areas which are thickening of the artery without frank plaque, that's what leads to myocardial infarction. And again, another props to Alan's slides. Alan went through the development of a necrotic core and a, a complex plaque. That's exactly what ruptures. So functionally, we have taken inflammatory skin disease and shown it increases heart disease. But better yet, I love that this was brought up, there are rupture prone plaques, those that are ready to rupture, right? And we have known that those rupture prone plaques cause myocardial infarction. So we went into our psoriasis cohort, and this is the best level of evidence. If these people already have heart attacks, they should have the presence of high risk coronary plaques, not just an elevated increase of plaques, but they should be high risk. So this was just published about a, maybe about eight months ago, looking at a series of psoriasis patients and comparing them to 60 year old, so 15 year older people with hyperlipidemia. So they had LDLs higher than 130 and they were 15 years older. And the psoriasis patients still had more heart disease, which was non-calcified, and they had the same amount of high-risk plaques as someone 15 years older than them. Really astoundingly scary, in my opinion, that they're developing these high-risk plaques, which are probably the ones that are rupturing. If you look at the odds ratios and you compare them to the common controls, there's a six-fold increase, statistically significant, of adjusted high-risk plaque compared to those who are hyperlipidemic, which didn't even reach statistical significance. Because the hyperlipidemics who are 60, they don't have high-risk plaque. They have garden variety atherosclerosis. They have narrowing of the arteries that are calcified, and they're going to cause maybe angina, but they're not going to be high risk in rupture. At that point, they're probably, they've outcompeted their risk of MI at that point. Uh, I'll skip that for time. But what I will say is that when you treat them, this is the best part. This was an open label 50 person. The first 50 that came back, in, in order, we looked at whether their treatment of their psoriasis improved their high-risk plaque and their coronary disease. And guess what? It did. And that gives me some hope that treating a remote organ actually can affect another organ, right? So in conclusion, what I would say is inflammation accelerates atherosclerosis. So I can't say it's causal. It may be causal in establishment of the disease. But we know of other models of sterile scenarios where there's no inflammation where athero can occur. But that tends to be mechanical damage, smoking damage from crystals, or diabetes damage from rage, right? So those are three scenarios where I can tell you probably not related to inflammation. But here I'm telling you I think it is in most cases. Human diseases associated with systemic inflammation augment CVD and its complications. I've given you pretty good data there. And this last part I really want to leave you with before I uh, uh, close, which is treatment of this remote inflammation in the skin decreases coronary diseases. However, sorry for the typo, larger studies are needed. We are in the process of writing a large randomized trial to test these findings. Um, and in the interim, I will leave you with my still Philadelphia Bay cell phone number and my NIH email, um, because I do like to uh, talk and, and have collaborative discussions. And I did leave some time for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was quite spectacular and stimulating. I hope we have some questions. Let's just see, any of the students or fellows or anybody have any questions? Yeah. Uh, could you pass this back, please? Hi, thanks for a great talk. Hi, thanks. I was just curious what you think about the increased prevalence, going back to autoimmune disease, the increased prevalence of autoimmune disease in women and how that might play into differences in gender risk for cardiovascular disease? Well, that's a great question. Um, we know autoimmune diseases are definitely upregulated in females, but certain ones are not. So if you look at psoriasis, it's an equal offender across male, males and females. It's a very good question. Lupus, definitely more women. RA, definitely more women. IBD, definitely more women. Um, how that plays on risk for heart disease, I've never thought about it. Um, there's probably some interplay with hormonal axes during that time that are probably those inflammatory disease patient women 
get their MIs right around menopause, perimenopausally. So there's got to be an interplay, but I don't know if it's been looked at systematically. But just so you can at least know one level of evidence is that women and men get psoriasis about the same. And what the question you asked actually came up in the review of our paper. Was there gender interaction on coronary plaque? And um, interestingly enough, we were underpowered in the 50, but when you do it in 250, women with psoriasis with low HDL actually get accelerated heart disease at an earlier age before menopause. So I'll look a little bit more into that if you want to just uh, you know sort of let us know. Are you on campus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd love to follow up with you on that. That's a great question. Um, so how effective do you think um, diet would be in combination with these types of medications and uh, as more research I smiled is at my out. team because we're, so what kind of diet, are you, are you, mani uh, are you asking about maybe like an, uh, a low fat AHA type diet or any type of diet, just a low fat? I mean, low fat, uh, high, High vegetables, protein, high, high protein, protein. Okay, yeah. okay. So we know Mediterranean diets are good in general. They're anti-inflammatory. We know the South Beach diet kind of ripped it off from that. Yeah. We had a talk about the ketogenic diet in the lab last week. We know that our mice are, we're in the process of feeding our psoriatic mice all carbohydrate. Because all of us have been doing high fat all these years. We're actually looking to how to just do high, high carbohydrate diet. What we do know, and I think Greg can probably say to this more in my lab, but when we do change their diet, I believe their psoriasis gets worse. Mm -hmm. So we know that fat contributes to psoriasis. In humans, um, when you have gastric bypass surgery and you lose weight, your psoriasis goes away in about one third of people. So that's another good one, but that could be the pro-inflammatory macrophages and the fat going away. Um, and then the last one is, is that they did this really, see what's nice about being in cardiology or in the vascular side is our studies are big and definitive, right? But in derm, in the derm space, they're not at all. They're actually very small and underpowered. But there was an interesting study in a pretty decent journal that showed if you took people and you put them on a super calorie restricted diet, like inhuman, like 500 a day or something, and you compared them to a standard 2,000 a day diet, by week, I think 12, the psoriasis actually went away on its own with nothing else but this diet inter 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 intervention. But it wasn't sustained after 12 weeks. So there's clearly a relationship. And the last piece of evidence I'm going to throw out there, because this got me thinking a lot recently, is did you know that what you eat can actually elicit an immune response? It's crazy to me. And it's a predictable T cell response. So I was meeting with some people on campus saying they know that certain foods elicit a predicted immune response. That's sort of really at, at, at the way that psoriasis is. That can make a lot of sense for our group, so we're starting to look into that as well. I've also heard that it um, could be potentially related to uh, gluten intolerance. It can. We haven't seen that, but it could be on the same spectrum that Alan was getting at with inflammation, mm -hmm. just sort of setting off different macrophage spe mm -hmm. species. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All of this reminds me to tell everybody that next week <clears throat> the subject is the microbiome. That's awesome. And... Uh, uh, some of these comments that have been made, you know, raise the question that this uh, old but new frontier may play a part in all of these processes. It was a question. Yeah, there's one over here. Yeah. So um, I'm interested in um, the genetic components of cardiovascular disease like LDLR or PSK9. Are they somehow involved in psoriasis as well? No, that's a great question. So when I came in 12, one of the first things that I did, so I used to work on genetic epidemiology of early MI. So I was part of the cardiogram consortium. So the first thing I did was I took the GWAS loci from psoriasis, which is 44 of them, and I looked in cardiogram, 150,000 people, and none of the variants showed up. There were two. Um, TNF-AIP3 showed up, but it still didn't reach genome-wide significance as an overlap. And then the one that you would hope, hoped would have worked with the SOAR1 gene, which when someone carries the SOAR1 gene, they always get psoriasis. So it's like a 100% penetrance, but when, we don't know exactly when. Um, no relationship. So there's clearly an, an environment component. And one thing I will bring up, I know we're running out of time, but the last minute, if I leave you marinating with something, think about, and we haven't even had a chance to talk about what you think about this, but 
chip, these clonal mutations that are acquired, right, through epigenetics or through different pathways, maybe there's something about a genetic predisposition in psoriasis that does predispose, and I didn't go over the sort of other things psoriatics get, but 35% get psoriatic arthritis, and those who get psoriatic arthritis always get diabetes. Those who get psoriatic arthritis always get heart disease. So that's a 35% population right there that's probably worth thinking about this. But the genetic piece to me is they probably have the predisposition and what the chip story is telling me, so this is clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, and these are mutations that are known to cause leukemias, but now if you don't get leukemia, you actually will next get heart disease. So people are getting really interested in these mutant carriers, and so my thought about that is maybe there's something similar going on in these inflammatory diseases, and that is being accelerated by inflammation, and that's the genetic link or predisposition, because in my cohort of 300 now, I have seen skip generations of, oh, no, 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 I have psoriasis, but my mom and dad had MIs. My parents had psoriasis, their parents had psoriasis. And then you go off into the uncle space or the cousin space, and there's definitely a upregulation or an overrepresentation of inflammatory diseases, whether it's RA, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, and cardiovascular disease. And these are early events. Oh, my, my grandfather had it when he was 38. My father had it when he was 51, and you're like, this is real. And they're coming in right around that time because it's about 10 years before they're scared of their event. So good question, though. Thank you. Are there any more? Yeah. Do you want to talk offline so that are you okay uh, staying over time? Are you okay staying over time? Well, as the saying goes, you can talk as long as you want, but we're going home in 20 Yeah, minutes. and I just want to be, <laughs> I want to be respectful. All right. So you mentioned about the two clinical trials on interleukin-1 beta inhibitor and the other is the... Methotrexate. So is there any benefit in these studies? We don't know yet. They're ongoing. We know the one on the right worked. The one on the IL-1 beta worked. But we don't know if you want my take on it. I think that it's a lot of money for a little gain, so we need to understand its purpose. Um, it's $64,000 for the 15% reduction, whereas a statin is 30% reduction for, uh, a, a, I don't even know what a statin costs here, $300 or something like that. So it's a fraction of the money. And the short question, you mentioned you are adding lipopolysaccharide, three nanogram per, per kilogram. kilogram. So, what is the normal level of the LPS in our blood? It's non-detectable in our blood. In fact, we have gone through and looked at assays. So what Alan said is really great that we think there's gut translocation, but you actually can't measure LPS. You actually have to measure what LPS is reacting to. So it's usually soluble CD14 levels. Um, there's certain T cell markers, but we don't. That dose, that three, nanogra three nanograms per kilogram, is actually half the dose used by the critical care department here. They use six. I used three, and then the next study I did that I didn't talk about used a fifth of that dose, 0. 0.6. Got the same immune response. Did you get fever? Yeah. I get a lot of fever. A short question regarding calcification. Is calcification involved in inflammation or other issues? In I, think, I think it's a late stage finding, and I think Alan's slide did that really nicely, that it happens really late. And I actually now, this is another thing I've been telling all my patients, I actually think that calcification is protective. I get a lot of patients coming back and being like, my calcium score is going up. Yes, but you're on statin, your LDL is low, your LDLP is low. The calcification marks that you have athero up front, but it doesn't tell you anything more. And in fact, if you keep checking it, you're probably checking it for the wrong reason. So I think calcification is a late event, and early calcification of a lesion is showing your body's ability to protectively heal it. But the high Agastin score in- I disagree, yes. It's a marker for the high Agastin score, but I disagree that it, it tells about the athro process. I seem to recall a study where uh, people looked at, uh, at LPS in the portal blood, yep. like after a meal and so forth. And you know, there is a uh, an it goes increase up. and goes down. And goes up. Up. Anyway, listen, thank you enormously, both of you, for very exciting and provocative uh, uh, presentations. That was Thank really outstanding. <laughs>